Well, we just um, are we're so excited, you guys, for y'all to meet our new friend. We've just been praying for her, <laughs> and we've two of uh, two of the three of us have just been crying. <laughs> uh, so we have Elizabeth. Um, Fisher Good joining us today. She is um, the author of an incredible book called Speak the Unspeakable. She um, hosts a community called Real Talk and is also part of the Foundation United. I think you're the director of that as well. Yeah. And um, but the thing, just to be honest with you guys, is um, I heard Elizabeth on um, on a forum with Sean Bowles and anybody that Sean Bowles endorses, you know, <laughs> Rachel and I are both like, okay, we're super interested in this person already. Uh-huh. But um, you share a very common heart with Rachel and I about um, coming out of secrets mm-hmm. and coming out of shame. And that's both Rachel and I stories, mm-hmm. uh, which of course you don't know that. And um so I, I just applaud you for the incredible work you're doing to help the exploited, the abused, you know, and just bringing the truth to light. But also more than that, you are helping lead people to the great shepherd who brings us into freedom. So just welcome. Yeah. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm so grateful to be here. And the prayer was worth everything. (laughs) (laughs) Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about your background. For those of us who don't know you and haven't heard you on Sean Bolts, tell us a little bit about how you got to this place. Yeah, well, I I like to say recently, like my last 30 years now makes sense. Right. Um, I started like my corporate life in my 20s. I was in advertising where the world was just... Mm. You know, what porn did you watch over the weekend? And no, that's not my wife, but it was it was out there. But wow. I was like, oh, this is crazy as a 20 something. And then um, after that, I went into ministry. I'd grown up at Willow Creek. So like a little background uh-huh. is my family was Baptist, Southern Baptist, raised in Chicago. Awana, like girl of the year, sword right. girl queen. Like, <laughs> Sounds like Rachel. <laughs> one, one the things, one the things. <laughs> Oh, yes. And then, but my mom's family in the summer was from Arkansas. So Pentecostal holiness. Wow. So in the summers, we stayed there. So, you know, running wow. around, speaking in tongues, jumping mm-hmm. in the pews. Like I was raised in the best of both. <laughs> right. And so, but I was sexually abused in the Pentecostal church mm-hmm. by sort of a worship leader type family member. And so a lightning bolt hit there. So I sort of yeah. put all that on the shelf, had a lot of judgment, had a lot of stuff. But then Willow formed when I was 11. So I was raised at Willow Creek Community Church, which was the perfect medium. Right. So that is sort of my, my neutrality that I, I went yeah. through the rest of my life in and not really healed, but just a safe, beautiful place. And so when I was in my 20s in the debauchery land, I was like, yeah, I probably can't do this the rest of my life. And so I went back at my master's in clinical psych. And then I ended up in leadership at Willow for a decade. And I was an area pastor in the North Shore, which is one of the wealthiest suburbs in Chicago. And yeah, I realized, you know, between advertising where they bragged about it, but I don't know if their spouses knew everything. And then I went back up my master's in clinical psych in the transition before I started at Willow. And everybody I worked with in my, you know, clinician, all the clinical stuff I had to do, it all started with a secret way back here. I mean, mm-hmm. they manifested completely differently, yes. like out of jail or psychotic, you know, all kinds of voices, demonic, whatever you want to call it. But it started way back here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You almost didn't believe their stories of what they told you they used to be because they didn't look like it at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then I go into Willow for a decade and, you know, there, there was things that you saw and I'm not talking about Bill. Like I still love Bill. I don't think that went down right at all. Right. Um, but I think that, there's things you just knew you couldn't run up the flagpole. Right. There's just some things that were just not going to be speakable. And that's just that. And move Mm. along, young lady. Yeah. And that never sat really well with me. And then the last decade, I moved from Chicago to Florida to do nothing. But God had other plans. I led a safe house. Um, I created an organization, um, one of the first in the movement, created Let Change Legislation. We 5,000 women and safe housing, but every single girl that we dealt with on the streets and the jails and the house through the whole over 11 years that I was the CEO there, they were almost like my North Shore women. Mm -hmm. It all started with the the same secret. Mm -hmm. It was all the same. Like Satan is so good at being in there, stealing a destiny at three, four, five years old. And these are just pathways. So I, after a decade of that, the Lord's like, I felt like Billy used to teach on holy discontent. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, we cannot be so downstream. We're just trying to give a bed to somebody who's 28 and been yeah. used their whole life for sex. And 
Satan has completely stolen. Yeah. You know, to, rather than trying to restore way over here, we have to get over here. So now that's what I do at the Foundation United. I'm the founder and CEO there, but we're looking at the systemic pathways of, you know, where do all these things happen and why is everybody missing it? And after focusing on law enforcement for so long and education system where they think the kids are stupid, but they don't realize they're in trauma, right. we have prevention everywhere. We have education and prevention, train the trainer systemically, healthcare educated over 800,000 ER doctors in 30 countries because 87% of them will stitch up a kid and have no clue. Right. A predator. Wow. But the Lord started stirring in me, you're missing the most important system mm. and the only system with the actual power to get to the root and change everything. Right. If only they would speak about it. And that's the church. And so our part for the church is called Real Talk. Mm -hmm. And it's for any individual. It just is that we call it a catalytic Holy Spirit can opener. Mm, <laughs> great name. That's my favorite. <laughs> oh, so good. And it's it's without judgment. Mm. And it's so so wild. It's it's a group. So everything we do is train the trainer. This fits perfectly. It goes into churches. It's kindergarten through leadership. So you could have a K through five group, a sixth through eighth grade group, a ninth through twelfth. But you t start with the leaders, you get the buy-in, you find out who your facilitators, but it takes them through going back, because I am a therapist, but this is not that. This yeah. is not like, oh, let's talk about your father for 20 right. weeks. No. Right. It, it's like, where does Satan have a foothold and let's be done? Yeah. You want to get this out in the light so we can be done with it because what is holding you back from your destiny? Any little thing. So we call it like excavating for gold. Yeah. And men and women together. The men, I would say, probably like it more than the women because wow. there's such freedom. There's no judgment. For the first time, they could say all kinds of stuff, and there's no shame because women are saying all kinds of stuff, and it's wow. actually helping each other understand each other and where it started out, and then it's like you bring in the truth. You start talking about it, and like you start severing mindsets, patterns, people yeah. that we blame. It's really just Satan. And so it's a wild, fun <laughs> journey, and that's sort of a little bit about where I am. I that's I, I love it because <laughs> yeah, you're hitting it all, you oh, know. Yeah. And we were when so she systemic. was telling this, I was like, "Golly, I can't imagine." You know, this kind of work typically you don't see it done with men and women together. So I thought that was amazing. I'd love to know, Elizabeth, for you, where you know you mentioned what happened to you, you know, within the church context. How did God really personally meet you and intersect your life and show you, the, Pat, like, help us to understand, like, what shame and abuse looked like? Because I know for me, it looked like perfectionism. It looked like hiding. It looked like wearing a mask, you know, those kinds of things. As I think it's helpful, sometimes people don't really understand what shame actually looks like right. in their life. They just think, well, I just, you know, am a control freak or yeah. I'm just a perfectionist, but you know what I'm saying? What did it look like in your story? Because you certainly don't look like the typical person that had been abused. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it plays out differently in everybody's life. Yeah. yeah. The book that goes with it is my new book called Speak the Unspeakable. And it, it helps people unpack it. It takes us through sections. But for me, what's so interesting is Satan, like I always say, like, as you come out of the womb, right, God has a purpose and you're born with this amazing purpose. So baby meets purpose. And the middle of that minute we come down, Satan's like, game on. Like, uh -huh. you're not God in the womb. He's at it. Right. And most people aren't raised to know mm -mm. you're in a battle. Like, you're like a superhero. And, you know, something's going to come after you. And it's going to come after you right where your purpose is. So for me as a kid, more than anything in the world, I loved the church. Like, mm -hmm. I loved family. My growing up in the church was unique. Not a lot of people were. Yeah. Pastor Holiness and Baptist. You know? <laughs> <laughs> No, All they the weren't. <laughs> they were either making fun of one or the other. That's right. <laughs> so you had a real meeting. appreciation. Oh, gosh. Right? And I, and I walked with love of all. Like, it was deeply entrenched to me because for me, um, probably the most defining moment for me that just set off everything of who I am is my sister was accidentally killed when I was little. So when I was wow. seven, she was almost 16. My brother was 17. And um, they were super close, and we had always went hunting in Arkansas when we were there. Oh, no. When we came back to Chicago, putting the hunting rifles away, his misfired. <gasps> she was hit in the temple, and she was like my everything. Oh, like my God. God. That gives me chills. Sure. Yeah. So I had a family of, like, 30 cousins. I'm the youngest, wow. Puerto Rican, Greek, Italian, like, a lot always going on. Wow. Of very, come by it honestly, dysfunction, chaos, abuse. Yeah. <laughs> but my sister was like my protector. Wow. So 
gone in an instant. And then a few months later, my brother turned 18. He joined the Navy, boop, gone in an instant. Whoa. So like I went from this loud, chaotic family to wow. silence. So wow. I learned really little. You're the youngest. No one cares about your grief. You knew her the least. Be quiet. Right. And so I learned to, you know, be there to comfort others. I don't really matter. Oh, my man. It's not as important as yours. Yeah. So I still had my Arkansas getaway. That right. That was like... Oh, everything's intact. I could stuff. Everybody talks about everything. It's the farm. Things die all the time. They talk yeah. about death. Like everything was normal there. But wow. of course, what does Satan do? Oh, let me use one of your favorite people and hit you with a lightning bolt there because I got to yeah. kill it over here too. Yeah. So right. I know like family, family, the whole dynamic of family, the whole dynamic of church is my heart. As a little kid, that's what was stolen from me. Right. So I was abused. It was like on the way to church. And then it was again in the car on the way to church. And then he grabbed his guitar and went into church. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, and I happened. never went back. Like, that was the end. That was that. I yeah. never went back to Arkansas. Wow. I know. And nobody asked. And here's the thing. Nobody asked. Yeah. That's that's everything. Yes. So many people are in their own trauma. And they don't want to know. They, they don't want to know. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. can't talk about that. So I better not ask. And so... I mean, I never went back. I went every year until wow. I was 11 or 12. Wow. And it was just stolen. And so mm. I think, um, mm. you know, for me, there was shame. Because as you guys know, it's the one thing that when it happens to the victim, we take on the shame, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And um, I just went more silent. And as my dad and mom then got divorced, I was mm. like, oh, come on. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I was you know, in middle school, and I got invited to some party, and someone gave me alcohol. So for me, the pivot was I got, like, blackout drunk, and someone had sex with me. I have no memory. Mm -hmm. And literally, that became the theme of my life. So I went from church girl to, like, little slut. So often when you hear me speak now, I'll always say, there's no such thing as a seventh grade slut. Can you pay attention? Like, yeah. something happened to that poor girl. Oh, yeah, and yeah, no such thing it's as good. Just a bad guy. What's happened to the guy? Like, we're all born perfect. Yeah. Until. Yeah. But yeah. we don't know how to speak about it. We just know how to judge. And yeah. the church is super good at not speaking. That's right. And, you know, yeah. one of our, our um, videos that we shared, we have a summit every year, and it was about a little girl that was raised in the church, and her family was everything. And when she was abused, she was kicked out of youth group because she changed mm. her behavior. So yeah. I'm wow. just passionate because for me, nobody was there with any questions. Yeah. So I'm the queen of questions. And I think that's why people love it. It's like this catalyst, like she's asking what, what? Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. You're saying, and then people are just, they're running to say things. Yeah. It's a platform of freedom where you could say it and say and anonymity because there's people all over the world. And, um, how so did you, I, I'm, yeah. where was the, what was the catalyst for ripping the bandaid off for you? Yeah. Like, did you encounter someone? Was it school where you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm putting this all together because mm -hmm. I mean, I look at my life and I mean, I didn't put it all together till I was 35. You know, what was, mm -hmm. what was that for you? What was that thing where you're like, that's why I did all that. Or did you, did you kind of have an awareness of that even in high school? Well, in high school, I knew I had a double life because I never stopped journaling. I was in love with Jesus. I went to church every Sunday, but I couldn't stop blacking out. <laughs> wow. The blackouts led to more shame. So yeah. then I ate. I'd be like that girl that goes into Publix and like um, buying a birthday cake and putting candles on it because I want to pretend I'm going to a party, but I'm really going to go home and eat it. All oh, by yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so Thank you for your honesty. Of, you know, I laugh about it, but when I was in it, it was literally. Oh, it's tormenting. Yeah. Keeping up the appearance. Mm -hmm. Sure. Dying inside. So I literally journal like, Jesus, I don't know how to get out of here. Everybody hates me. Everybody. So mm, they had me really pegged and mm -hmm. I just got worse and worse and harder and harder. Yeah. But I never, this part of me didn't die. It just went so hidden. Yes. In the church, but nobody asked. Like it just made no sense. Yeah. And so for me, I love that you say you were 35. I was 34 before mm -hmm. I had my real, real epiphany. Um, but we're always, you know, until we're dead. Yeah. Yes. Dead. Oh, we're it's back, constant. Right? <laughs> we, we need more epiphanies to keep going. But I thought I didn't know I wasn't healed. And I think that's another thing. You know, yes. The Bible talks about the gifts are without repentance. So we still have our gifts. And even if we don't, we have blind, because it's typically blind spots, you know, yeah. shame creates blind spots. Yeah. So we think we're good. But if there was a pathway to repentance, which is what real talk is now, we would be up here, you know? Yeah. So we, we settle for here because we don't know. I was very, I, I ran after my master's in clinical psych. I was like 
a, a psychology junkie. I was, you know, almost done with my doctorate. I, I was in small group leadership, doing everything like leading groups, sort of like I am now, but right. I, yeah. I wasn't healed enough. I was doing it with the wrong motive, like to yes. dig into them. Yeah. But I was on stage at Willow Creek. I was killing it. Like I really thought I had. I've got it together. together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I bet. I, my catalyst, Me too. <laughs> I thought that was awesome because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in the level of shame I had been in. Yeah. You know, I think we level up. Yes. Yes. Eating. yes. I'm not eating five right. donuts. I'm not no blacking out. Overeaters Anonymous. I'm not, right. You know, mm-hmm. Thankfully I have a good metabolism, but I wasn't, you know, I still was numbing in a yeah. lot mm-hmm. of ways. Yeah, but I was used to those ways and I didn't even think about them because, you know, my first book was called Groomed. We're raised in stuff. My family was so generationally dysfunctional that I didn't see it as a conflict because yeah. we always went to church, but we also always did this. Right. So mm. The things mm-hmm. we normalized. So when I was 34, I was pregnant with my third. So this was my, whew, yeah, which only God could do the way he did it um, because I didn't know I needed it. So I was pregnant with my third and I had a problem with my placenta, I had placenta previa. Mm-hmm. I was about to have to go on bed rest with two toddlers. I'm like, no way. What am I going to do? So my Catholic friend, and that was another denomination that I'd been through judgment and, you know, sure. when I tell you, you can't take communion, like what? So a lot of wounds in my childhood when I went to Catholic church with friends. So she was having a healing mass and she's like, you know, I forgot to ask you. And I said, oh my gosh, I have placenta previa. And he had put his hand on her where she had cancer previously and it went away because she had called me like, do, do Catholics have the gift of healing? I'm like, <laughs> I doubt it. You know, like, I'm like, <laughs> it's like not that I've seen. But I'm like, you have nothing to lose. And, and she was healed. So right. years later, she's having this guy at her house, not knowing that I had a placenta previa. And I was like, don't tell him. I'm coming. And I go running there. And he's like, who's first? I'm like, me. And I'm always willing to run. And as he's standing over me, so like full on priest and all the priestly garb mm-hmm. and his two guys next to him. And they just start praying. He's like, what do you want? And I said, I just want a healthy delivery. He's like, you're at a healing mass for a healthy delivery? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I'm such a liar. You know, like, I'm just- <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow. And he's like, all right. So he starts praying and like mm. three times he goes, I can't pray. He said, it's like, there's another baby blocking our prayer. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I'm thinking in my mind, this guy is no good. Look at this. Right. And he's like, wow. have you miscarried and you're blaming God? I'm like, no, I have two perfect children pregnant with my third. And then finally one of his prayer partners goes, father, I feel like it's more of a sin. And then I was like catapulted. <sighs> In the height of all of my sleeping around, blackout drunk, shame, of course, I had an abortion. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, if I have this baby, I will never get out of this this trailer parkish life I'm living. Like, what am I doing? And I was so, I didn't even think about it. It right. was so locked in a box over oh, here. Yeah. yeah. And so when he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, I had an abortion 17 years ago. And he goes, have you ever confessed it? I go, confess it? I'm not Catholic. We don't do confession. Mm-hmm. And uh, he goes, oh, you Protestants. He goes, do you believe in the Bible? Like James 5, 16, confess your sins one to another. The prayer of a righteous man has authority to heal. And I was like, oh yeah. And he goes, okay, can I anoint you with oil and pray in tongues? I'm like, you pray in tongues? What's going on? You know, that was gone since my Arkansas days. And he goes, oh, you've never seen a completed Catholic. I'm like, oh. Oh, gosh. So had a name for it. And he was like, all right, now the Lord would have you do penance. And I said, again, not Catholic. We don't do penance. And this is what real talk has all these steps. We call it penance, which really he said, you know what penance is for you Protestants? You've had some secrets for a really long time. You have some serious soul wounds. Do you think you might need to create some new soul patterns and learn how to walk it out? Penance will help you walk out your healing. Do you want to walk out your healing? I'm like, oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> like this guy was so biblical. And as he prayed, you know, remove from you for, as far as the East is from the West, like it was just beautiful. So his penance was for me to go serve in a pro-life center. And I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't even talked. No way. But I, you know, made my decision in the moment and I'm like, I'll do it. And that was a healing story. I didn't meet with anybody. I was there to heal. It was beautiful. It's like that center that I went to was prepared for my, walk me through my healing and start Mm -hmm. that process. But then he went on. He's like, the Lord's showing you, you have more open doors. And this is the real talk process. Like it gets the open doors like this. And he starts saying, um, the Lord's showing me pornography. And I'm in front of like two of my really affluent North Shore friends. I'm like, Okay. Did he say that out <laughs> loud? I've grown yeah. up from being sexually abused 
and then porn just became a normal part. And that's very common. Like a lot of the men sure. that are talking about their addiction now, yeah. it started when they were a child, either with abuse or something that opened the door to porn for them. And then it's progressive. You know, yes. that on ramp of, you know, Ooh, how'd I get here? I bought a kid. What happened? And so I didn't even, I was on stage and I had a so total secret porn life. And it was from being abused by girl on girl. And, mm -hmm. and when I speak about that, that brings freedom to people. Because yeah. Sex stuff has deeper shame. Yeah. And he just went through a list. He, I had to close the door to um, the occult. Because yeah. Because my family was very into, let's go to church and then stop it when we're at the grocery store, buy your horoscope. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. You know, how often do you walk in church? I Everywhere I go, people are like, oh, when's your birthday? Are you Gemini? I'm like, oh my gosh, the occult is everywhere. Mm, and yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. even in other things, right? Control. You know, which, yeah. there's so much of the occult that we don't even think about as Christians. And then he had me repent of psychology as idolatry. Wow. Wow. There, you know, I was holding myself up here. So what are the things that we have idolatry around that we're getting? Our, you know, so all of this happened and I was just stymied and humbled and embarrassed. He went through like seven open doors. Oh, yeah. You gotta wow. get the book. There's a lot. But every one of them, I didn't see. Yeah. I really huh. didn't see. Because yeah. it, my gifts were without repentance. I was in love with the Lord and I was serving. And I think that's what happens. We live these double sure. unreconciled lives. Yes. And so when he did all this, you know, at the end, he said, you know, I want to take one more moment. The Lord wants to give you one more gift. I'm like, dear Lord. And um, before he prayed for my physical healing, he said he wants to give you the gift of tears. And he said, mm. your heart has gotten so hardened. Wow. And just Gosh. Stopped. And then he's like, honey, I don't know who you are or where you're going because I've never had a night like this. <laughs> wow. he, goes, he goes, you also have been given a complete healing. You know, don't resume regular activity to see your doctor. But um, wow. you're good. All wow. restored. So it took, you know, they say uh, seven is the biblical number of completion. Yeah. I moved to Florida seven years later. I, I would say it took seven years for the walkout. Of yes. That to make sense, probably. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing for people to understand the walkout. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Don't just it, like, oh, I'm going to start a ministry because yesterday I had an epiphany. Uh -huh. And yeah. people do that and Satan gets some more. Um, yeah. It was the beginning of, oh my gosh. I mean, that was in 03. And here we are 20 years later. Yeah. Real talk. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, Later. it's so. I what I love about your story, and I, what I want people to hear is, you know, there's no rush. It's like we want it all done. We we want these, you know, completed Catholic prayer moments. You know, like where yeah. you encounter somebody and in the Lord. I just want everybody to hear who maybe feels like they're still not quite free. They've maybe you've had some inner healing, or maybe you've been through some deliverance, and you've tried renewing your mind don't don't stop no. um the lord is is with you and he's committed fully to your healing and to your wholeness and he's he's committed to your journey and i the other thing too that kind of stood out the minute you said the word confess i think there's such a um there's such a we have such a religiosity i don't i can't think of the proper word for yeah. it around that word and I love what Jamie Winship says. He says, it just means tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah. It means to tell the truth. It means mm -hmm. to it all. It really means in, in Greek, say the same thing as another. And what Jesus is saying is that I'm not afraid of your secret. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Yeah. I'm not afraid of your secret. You're the one that's afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> and um, and even that repentance, it, it means to change your mind and all through these seven years, what I can hear in your voice and your story is God was changing your mind. Yeah. And we have always made repentance about it's something I need to do to change God's mind. No, he's saying you're the one that needs to have your mind changed, right? Yeah. How has he changed your mind? Well, you know, it's so funny. You know, I, I grew up in Chicago and, you know, now I'm in Florida and just not getting into politics, but the world is very divided today. So yes. mindset, there's a mindset up there and there's a mindset yes. down here. And whatever you're raised in is sort of your mindset. So even I remember so being in church and when, when the when the priest told me to, you know, call a pro-life center, I remember it was back when there was yellow pages. I'm going through the yellow pages and I'm looking for a pro-life. And I call and I literally said, Hey, you know, I guess I've been pro-choice. Oh. <laughs> you know, like that that's even okay in my brain, as, you know, to say that. Um, but and lead with that, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm pro-choice. Yes. I'd like to help out at your clinic. 
know. And I said, but I just had a really weird experience. I don't even know what wow, it is. Wow, I guess I'm, you know, pro-life and I have my master's in clinical psych. Do you need help? <laughs> They're like, oh, yes, we've been praying for you. Come in. Wow. Like, wow. So I went in the next day and it was a Catholic center and they had a 24-hour um, chaplain on the bottle, chapel, chapel on the bottom. And I went in there. I'm like, what is this? And they're like, we're here 24 hours a day praying because people actually think they're coming to have an abortion. Yeah. And they get switch pitched upstairs. I'm like, what? This is Catholic? Like, it's yeah. totally, even in it, the Lord was doing an ecumenical healing in me. Sure. He Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So to have the charismatic. Uh huh. You know, all the pieces. Because oh my Bible gosh. Right all the is, faiths are uh -huh. so beautiful. Every, you know, just so beautiful. I know. It's like, it really is. We've been through the same thing. Of, I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I was Catholic and then I was Baptist and then I was Pentecostal. Right. So in Rachel, I mean, so uh, I'm our Baptistical, I yeah. guess, if I had to title. Right. And, and it's yeah. like it, you have these judgments about the other. I mean, that's really part of Rachel's story. Mm -hmm. Big you time. Know? Yeah. Well, and even, you know, I mean, I, we meet you know, like what you're saying, you completed Catholics or whatever. I mean, there's such even judgment among evangelicals. That's, that Absolutely. is what's so sad is we can't see the beautiful parts of each other yeah. because we grow up with these judgments and these confirmation biases against um, other denominations. And it's so hard. It limits, you know, it's such a governor on what the Lord wants to do through all of us. And I mean, I, and I really, I mean, it, I don't know. I, I'm so like over saying, you know, the Lord's not coming back till we're unified. I'm kind of like, I, I don't know anymore. I mean, I'm kind of like, we know I, nothing I anymore. I know nothing about Revelation. I know less, the older the, I get, the less we know. <laughs> I'm going to say it all like, the time. No clue what Jesus is doing. I have no idea. I have to even read Revelation anymore. I mean, it's just so hard. But at the same time, I know unity is always going to be his heart. Mm. You know, he's like, look at me. Through people like you, you know, what I, what I've done through all these different streams. So I just, I think it's so unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we have 47,000 denominations now in the Protestant religion. Good heavens. And, you know, from Lutheran to Pentecostal, right. and we judge each other. And the beauty of this, like what we're doing now with Real Talk is people are signing up. We do it on Zoom. It's a train the trainer. And they come from all over the world, all denominations with anonymity yeah, and immediately see how everybody is the same. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like it is like a catalyst that the Lord is using to bring that part, but it's a small part. Most yeah. of the church isn't running to like, Ooh, you have something that we could speak the unspeakable. No Real thing. quick, Elizabeth, will you tell us just like the latest stats? I feel like they change every day mm -hmm. because I do think people, mm -hmm. um, there is still like, I will say, especially in the South, like there is just still this don't ask, don't tell mentality mm -hmm. around abuse, which is so, I mean, even though the Me Too movement, it doesn't matter. Like mm -hmm. there is just still like, don't mess anything up. This is makes things messy and complicated. So can mm -hmm. you talk about abuse, especially familial abuse? Because I think like that was my story for sure. Not my immediate family, distant family, but how can you, can you speak to the statistics? Cause that's, it's yeah. sobering. Yeah, and what, what I think is important, and I love that you bring it back to statistics, is like the stats in the church are the same as the stats out of the church. Mm -hmm. So I really think that, you know, the church people need to hear that we're yep. no different. Right. I keep saying just because you sit in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. You know, sitting in a building doesn't make you necessarily a Christian. And we have to be willing to not just count the numbers and get people saved, but we got to get people healed. Yeah. Because they're not stepping into their gifts. Therefore, we're not able to be the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Positions for this time of war that we're in. So it's really important. So the stats in or out of the walls, any, any zip code, doesn't matter where you are. One out of three little girls are carrying a secret. One out of five little boys. Columbia University says the average person carries 13 secrets at any given time. Wow. Five of which they've never spoken out loud to another human being that you wow. have to do with sexual perversion or some sort of deviance. The stats of sexual abuse or any abuse, like because verbal abuse, all these different traumas, they will enter at three, four, five years old, typically, that's statistically. The average age people will speak to any of it, 53 years old. 53. So what happens there, especially in where we're supposed to be the body of Christ, we have all this trauma from childhood, 
we don't speak to it, that means that we are living in blind yeah. spots. We don't have the ability to become advocates. That's why very few churches are able to say, oh, I care passionately about sex. Most pastors are like, oh, it's a little difficult. I don't know that my congregation could hear it because if we haven't mm -hmm. dealt with any open door to our own sexual trauma, mm -hmm. which the majority of people are carrying some sort of sexual trauma yeah. or trauma that they witnessed. And if we don't speak to it, we have the inability to, to, you know, to intervene. And so statistically also, they say that a child now, because we used to be, you know, my demo, my age group, we had Playboy, airbrush porn. You had to find sure. it under a bed or a dad's toilet, some right. neighbor's house, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, now right. our kids with these phones. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. And, and the porn that Satan is systemically. So if we look at things systemically, we used to be, you know, you'd find porn. It could be an open door after abuse. Now it's coming in. So the average, so pediatrics, American Academy of Pediatrics says the 75% um, of four-year-olds are given a smart device. Oh, oh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And most parents don't realize that there, there's stuff in Congress right now, but of course it hasn't passed yet, but everything comes preset to explicit. Are so you serious? Systemic advance on the, the neural pathways of our children. So oh my what gosh. was the most recent Disney movie that had a remake? Puss in Boots, right? Mm. So a child at four years old is like, play me video, play me Puss in Boots. An image comes up. What we know with neuro pathways and with imagery yeah. is that an imprint will come into a child's brain. And so if it, pornography is there or something is seen, it immediately has all these synapses that are going off that shouldn't be happening yeah. at a young age. So what yeah. we know statistically now is that eight and nine-year-olds are literally through their neuro pathways being reformed, addicted to porn. Eight or nine years old. Oh, Lord we Jesus. are watching... Mm -hmm. um, there's, you guys will know this as moms. When we, there's a chemical that's released in our body, mm -hmm. the Lord made it to be released for two different things, um, nursing and orgasm. Right. Oxytocin. Right. Yeah. And it's typically when you're much older, right? So right. we are seeing that 11 year olds, 10 year olds are releasing oxytocin to a chemical, to a screen. And wow. so there's bonding happening that's interfering with our natural ability to relate and bond to each other. Right. So systemically, our children don't know what intimacy is. Yeah. And more that we're like, well, we don't talk about that. That's why we created the K through 12 for real talk, because what these little girls and little boys are going through, our porn was airbrushed. They say that the porn from Playboy back in my day is what the cover of Cosmo is, what's just the right. Model, everything right. Now. Well, I mean, it's what you see on Instagram. Well, it was Britannica. I mean, honestly, yeah, for but me, I mean, it was like, like looking up like I mean, body parts. But I mean, now you can get it on. It's just on Instagram. I mean, uh, uh, there's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's so Elizabeth, what, what would you say? Cause I'm, I'm hearing the mom who's sitting out there who's got children this age and, uh, you know, it's overwhelming. It is. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, I, my children are older, so it's like, I'm not in that same space right now. And yet but it we'll makes my children. Yeah. And it makes my heartbeat fast just hearing this. It, so say a mom does, you know, discover, oh my gosh, like, yeah, they have been secretly looking at porn. I mean, the real stuff, you know, what yeah. would be their next steps? Yeah. I think if they can't get them in a community, like I would, I would have everybody go to your pastor and say, can we please sign up for this real talk? Like, <laughs> yeah. Or if it's a mom that hasn't dealt with her own sexual trauma or a dad that hasn't dealt with her own sexual trauma, sign up for a real talk group, you know, at our mm. website, real talk collective, um, dot TV, sign up for a group, get your healing. But the truth is we just need to speak. We have to speak to our kids when we roll it out for the children it's not shame. You're like, oh my gosh, don't look at porn. It's going to ruin your life. Because you know what they'll do? They will go so deep underground. Oh, yeah. They'll never find it. But they'll be like one pastor. He was so funny. He's like, we didn't even have computers. We, I knew what happened to me. And I didn't. His kid got addicted to porn at the library. I yeah. get letters from inmates in jail. Like, Elizabeth, keep talking. You know, wow. I didn't realize how bad <clears throat> child porn was. Now I'm in prison. And, and it's the it's the fastest growing addiction that we have, mm. but we're not talking about it because I mean it's a money maker. Yeah. So when you say so specifically, you're saying like say they're they're not able to immediately get into a real talk group or the like so uh, talk to your child. So what, what I said to my son because I of course raised two sons and a daughter and yeah. they came from generational sexual yeah deviance right. So when I found out when they were looking at porn because here's the truth most parents you needed to say. 
yes, your kids are probably looking at porn. So let's just normalize that. And yeah. if they're not, they're going to have somebody show them and they might yep. or might not get addicted to it. But the conversation is, hey, honey, I don't want it. There's no shame here. And there's, you know, nothing bad or wrong with you. Right. It's, it's you know, coming at you fast yep. and furious. I care about your future. I care about your marriage. I care about intimacy. I want you to, to learn how to love well. And they're, they're marketing Viagra to 20 year olds because systemically mm. they're not able to be with a real person. Oh, by wow. 20. gosh. And so I say, I, I just want you to understand it has a stronghold. It's no different than getting addicted to a drug. Like yeah. It wants to steal your future and you're so valuable. Mm, that's you good. Have an amazing wife coming and I just don't want you to lose. And girls are so addicted. Every time we speak, I have a ton of girls saying, I haven't told anybody. I can't stop. Why. And they'll say they're addicted to anime porn. Like there's so much out there. Oh, so gosh. Boys and girls and they know and they're starving to talk about it. So I would just on our website mm. at the Foundation United, we have so many resources. Mm, awesome. You can watch videos with them. You could buy a book. They want to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like the seventh graders will say, I wish I had had this in fourth grade because that's when the boys started showing me naked and saying, if you want to be my girlfriend, you got to send me a picture. Like, sure. It's just the norm now. Yeah. Um, Can you speak to worst. like controls on like, if you do have a 13 year old, like we waited till eighth grade, you know, to give our, but yeah. what, how can you hand over a device and, you know, do your homework before to me, they're complicated. I mean, that's the thing I don't love and about bark and every... yeah, I mean, God, they're so, it's so complicated to set that up. What do you recommend for parents who are like, okay, let me nip this in the bud, hopefully protect them because they do a good job. I think some of the ones that are out there, right? Well, I think the the fallacy for parents is that you're not going to lock your kids out of porn. Mm -mm. I, I think you need to learn how to speak to your kids about their worth so much more. Yeah, and you that's good. Take shame off the table because I remember my good. kid. I found somebody else's iPad in his drawer. I go, what is this? He goes, mom, I just want to see boobs. <laughs> He's like, you've locked up all of our stuff. Like, they're going to go underground. They're going to find it. They're yeah, going awesome. to find it. Mm. So it can't be a forbidden. I mean, there's a reason that we have this apple, right? Oh, I uh, know. Like, so satanic. Yeah. God, God wants us to be able to, to, to lead the narrative. You just got to take the narrative back. I don't think you could lock your children out of access because they're going to sit next to somebody on the bus that has full access. Yeah. They need to know they're worth more, they're more valuable. But for little kids, yes, you have to. And they change it all the time. But yeah. I, would, I would Google. I think on our website, we might have the steps at the Foundation United under resources. Okay. Found, the foundationunited.org. But there's settings and they come preset. You got to go to um, settings, parental guidelines, explicit. To, it, it goes from... Um, youth seven all the way up to explicit. They're preset and explicit. So you just have to turn off, turn off explicit, turn off, you know, R, turn off 17, turn off. I even turned off PG when they were little, mm -hmm. but they change the phones every mm -hmm. time there's an update and mm -hmm. there's no updates constantly. Wow. Because this is the market. They want our children systemically addicted. Gee, it's, a, it's, it's disgusting. You know, they're, it's all connected, <sighs> all of this industry. So I think for us, it's more, I keep saying the church needs a new marketing team. We need to take back the narrative. We need to normalize things. Mm. We need a unified campaign to speak to it. You yeah. Know, one of my, my new chairman of the board, he talks about the Muslims and the um, Mormons and even the homosexual movement. Fastest growing three movements in the world because they're unified. They're wow. one solid group and they have marching orders. They're strategic mm. and they're advancing. And the church with our division and splintering and mm. the infighting and the jealousy and the judgment, we're not taking any ground. We're losing it. Mm. We're children are watching, but who's talking to them really well? All those other movements. Mm. And that's why, you know, for me, when I had my sexual abuse by a girl, I was very confused and I was little. I had to be six, seven, eight. And I was like, why did that feel good? Am I a boy? Right. So today in the marketing world of, yeah, you know that movement. There would have been a campaign in my face. Oh yeah, I wanted, I wanted a sex change. Oh my I mean, gosh, it's unbelievable. We have to take it serious and mm -hmm. stop hiding. We're the mm -hmm. church. We're the most powerful system in the world. So yeah, as parents. I think it's just learning. My book is just a really great walkthrough of how to speak just like this, and it, it helps you because mm -hmm. I say, you know, it's not intentional; it's generational. But we don't just break it. 
You know, we don't just live broken. We're breaking it forward now by staying. Amen. Breaking, it forward. Yes, breaking it forward. Yes, breaking it forward. Elizabeth, as we wrap up, will you just, um, unless you have anything else, no, no, I mean, inquiring yeah. minds want to know, yeah. but I'm like, will you just pray yeah. that prayer, breaking it forward? Yeah. That, that is like, so I, I've never said that before. No, I love it. I, we're like breaking That's agreement, we we're but breaking we're it breaking it forward for the next mm. generation. So will you pray that out over like every woman, man listening to this, that's like thinking, golly, this is my grandchildren's future. It feels daunting, but it, there's hope. That's I mean, right. there is hope. God is, so he is much so hope. much bigger than, than porn ever and, will be. And here's the thing. He planted this dream in you, but he's wanting to plant it in so many other mm-hmm. people. I, I can just sense the people that are listening. Mm-hmm. He's planting this dream in you. And he wants, first, he wants you free. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, one step you can take right now in getting stepping into your freedom is telling the truth. Yeah. Telling somebody the truth. I, We, Rachel and I, the mm-hmm. three of us here can tell you, listen to us. Mm-hmm. You cannot believe how much freedom comes mm-hmm. just by telling somebody your secrets. Yeah. Well, and I would say if there's anything in your life that you cannot share that yeah. is the very thing to share. Yes, that's you right. Know? That's probably part of your destiny. That's it right. Is. That is still held back is probably part of what the world desperately needs. That's yeah. right. And that is exactly the whole talk of Speak the Unspeakable because we literally are are holding holding the wrong things back and it's telling your story. So I think as yeah. I close what I would what I pray everybody and I will pray, but telling your story isn't telling it an accusation. It isn't sitting down yes. with your mother and confronting her. It isn't telling your dad where he failed and he stinks. Mm-hmm. It's starting with, as my own experience, I just want to share with you. And as you start yes. learning how to, and that's what we teach and speak against people as well, like how to tell your story with just sharing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people can get hooked into the compassion of it. And then when you're done, you have a reaction that you're looking for versus yeah. an expectation that you better be sorry. Like yeah. nobody wants to hear that story. Yeah. They want to hear... This is what happened from my experience. And then they are able to have compassion and love. So, yeah. so I'm good. Right now. Thank mm. you, Lord. Yes. Mm. So, Father God, I'm just so thankful mm. for these two women and for their amazing hearts and the platform you've given them. And Lord, every single listener, you have them here for a reason. There is yeah. no accident that they're tuning in because we are reaching a place in our world that they are so vital. Yes. And the parts of them that are still locked up, Lord. That's the secret sauce, and that is the tool and the weapon that is needed to be unleashed. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be unleashed to their future generations and everybody they have influence over, Lord God. Mm -hmm. So I pray that you will just give them this divine, divine excitement, like a crazy exhilaration that they can't even understand. But they're like, Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, I'm going to do this. I'm Mm going to take whatever it is, take a next step. Mm. I'm sure they'll list resources here. If it's buying a book and talking to your kids, whatever it is, one next step so that you can t- step into your destiny. Everything is mm. pathways forward. If we're not taking a pathway forward, we're not standing still, you guys. We're going backwards. We are mm. constantly in spiritual formation. So I pray right now a release of forward moving, freedom, yeah. forward Amen. moving yeah. that is changing and breaking generational yes. patterns so Lord. that we are able to break off and name it. Mm-hmm. You can't break something off until you can name it, Lord God. Yeah. Our story is just our testimony and our testimony becomes our platform and that's how we change everything. Mm. And everything that's inside a person right now listening as their heart is probably beating because mm. they're like, oh my gosh, I wanted to do this. I don't know if I could do it. Mm. I just pray for peace and clarity, Lord yes, God, Father. to take a next step. Step. Yeah, yeah, and I re I uh, renounce the enemy, Lord. Right now, we just bind the airways of where the enemy is trying to get in. Mm-hmm. As we end this show, Lord, do not mm-hmm. let him come back and try to steal anything that was said mm-hmm. or steal anything that was known, but rather firm up a concrete, solid wall yeah. around the intentions you put in their hearts, Lord, because they're desperately needed. Yeah, so bless these two ladies and mm-hmm. everybody they reach in this ministry. May it grow and abound, Lord, yeah. and their families and generational freedom that will change the world. Yes, because everybody is looking and everybody needs it. Yeah, in your powerful name, Jesus. We just love you. Amen. Amen. Amen.